Pyro, a bit of a late reply to a video that you made to me a week ago, I guess, um, concerning Jainism. Um, I'm going to clear the air. First of all, I'm not a Jain. I don't subscribe to Jainism. I'm not even a vegetarian. Most of my cuisine is vegetarian. That's just the food that I like. But uh, whenever my wife cooks meat, I eat it. Uh, I had a slice of ham this morning with my breakfast, so there you are. Just so we get that out in the open at the beginning, I'm not proselytizing in favor of something I don't adhere to, just so we know. Um, <clears throat> I have a throat cold, so anyway, uh, and it's dry here. But I do find Jainism fascinating, and I like an awful lot of the tools that Jains use in their cosmology or epistemology or just knowledge gathering techniques, I guess. Um, Anakantavada obviously is one of them. That's, to me, one of the most useful tools I've ever come across. It's not really a doctrine. It's sort of just um, an attitude that uh, uh, there are two sides to every story. I find that interesting in that it assumes that everybody has reasons for thinking the way they think. In other words, how do you deal with somebody who profoundly disagrees with you? <clears throat> um, people note my habit of walking up and forcing myself into the face of people who will pretty much guaranteed profoundly disagree with me. Why do I do that? Um, well, the union of opposites produces uh, another whole, I guess. Uh, maybe I'm just a argumentative jerk. I don't know, but <laughs> I try to at least be nice about it. But uh, as a lot of people have realized, my niceness is more or less just—I um, won't say a phony mask, but it's just a, a YouTube persona that I, I just don't want to get involved in, in personal conflicts. Uh, it's just I just ignore them. It's not because I'm not that kind of a person. It's just I don't I don't see YouTube that way. So Anakandavada is a way to come at people who utterly disagree with you because you sort of you sort of say okay this person disagrees with me fundamentally um, and they have a reason for it. In the very nature of things they must. Or otherwise they wouldn't have that point of view. Um, that's causality, isn't it? So, <clears throat> Anakandavada says, um, or if you use it a certain way, it says, if you had been in their shoes and experienced everything they experienced, you would be exactly the same as they are. You would believe what they believe, because they are a product of their environment or a product of their being, I guess, whatever, however you want to define that. So, the other option to that is, the, other, the alternative to Anakandavada is um, believing that somebody is just wrong, stupid, uh, defective, um, dishonest, sophistic, or whatever. Um, they're just um, either dishonest or they're faking it or they're they're stupid, de defective. Now this is why I tend to not get too worked up about people who are overwhelmingly abusive on the net. Um, very few things really get to me. I tend to laugh when people insult me. The only thing that I generally block people for are the usual politically incorrect stuff like racism, sexism, homophobia. Um, if somebody comes out and says, I am a troll, I'll block them usually after a warning, uh, stuff like that. But people are free to disagree with me all they want. It's you know, I, I might just not deal with them anymore, but it, it's not the sort of thing that I'm going to get worked up about because I don't want to get sidetracked. It, it's not that I'm a nice guy, because I'm not. <laughs> I'm just a human being like everybody else. <clears throat> so Anakantavada, I think, prevents you from falling into that rut and that rutted thinking that says that there are people out there who are just plain assholes. Um, I, don't, I don't think there is such a thing as an asshole. Um, I, they people react the way that they react. The entire their entire past has pre prepared them for the very moment that they're existing in now, and they've got a reason for whatever they're doing. Um, even if it is an impish sense of humor that in, that you know you enjoy screwing people up and getting them frustrated. That's human nature. Um, you know you can't judge people for that. It is kind of fun to to 
control people in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> so Anaconda Vada, I think, is a great tool to be used when you're trying to figure out what's in the other guy's head or the other person's head. Um, it doesn't always work, of course. Some, sometimes people are just beyond your comprehension. Um, people who are consistently hostile, misanthropic, dismissive, and insulting by nature. I have a tough time getting my head around that. I just, you know, I think, okay, just a misanthrope, and that's the end of it. Um, but I would be a misanthrope too if I had lived in their shoes. So, you know, you can't really judge people for that. Um, it's a way of avoiding the judgmental trap, the judgment trap. Um, there's another tool that the Janes use a lot, which I'm surprised you didn't come up with, um, which is uh, Syadvad, which is in the wiki article as well on Anakantavada. And it's uh, rather interesting, I'll just say here, it's the theory of maybe. Now, maybe actually is one of the English language's most underused terms, if you ask me. Because it's not yes and it's not no. It's not saying one thing is right and the other thing is wrong. It's saying um, maybe it is. And that's why I say I'm not a solipsist and I'm not a nihilist. Even though people will persist in, in seeing me that way. But I guess, again, I have to rely on Anakantavada to say, okay, well, from their point of view, I am one. So, you know, okay, they're going to call me that, whatever. <clears throat> but maybe is not the same thing as no. Um, I would assume that a nihilist or a solipsist, or, well, they're not the same thing, but let's say a nihilist would say everything is garbage or, you know, nothing. Whereas I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying nothing that I can be certain of. That's not the same thing as saying nothing. Nothing is certain. Or at least it takes a position of certainty. Whereas, you know, the, the theory of maybe says, uh, maybe. You know, there's obviously something acting on me. I don't know what it is. The outside world. It's there, apparently. It's hard for me to ignore. I don't want to uh, do the usual stereotypical standing in front of a speeding train because I know what will almost certainly happen. Uh, therefore, there is something out there. Um, or maybe there is. It certainly looks that way. <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> same thing for a solipsist. Now, a solipsist can mean any number of things, but I think the solipsist term that is used most often on YouTube is, you know, like nihilism, it's kind of a term of abuse or at least dismissal, saying that, well, you, you don't believe anything, you don't believe that anything is going on outside. Well, maybe I don't believe anything, but why should one believe anything? Belief, what is belief? Belief is taking something at, at face value, which I won't do. But also, <clears throat> an abject refusal to accept the outside world is another form of of, uh, of solipsism, if you ask me. Uh, a refusal, or another form of absolutism, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> that, to me, is solipsism, saying there is nothing else out there. I can see how you might not be sure of anything out there, but it seems as though there is. So, um, maybe, Siadvad sort of prevents that kind of dichotomy, that kind of binary thinking uh, from taking hold, or at least it can help you prevent it from taking hold. Um, we're all guilty of binary thinking in one form or another. As I say, if somebody came on and started, I don't know, praising Adolf Hitler, I'd probably block him. Why? Well, because <laughs> I think in binary ways. That's why the Nazis were bad. I don't know why I think that. Well, I think I know why I think that, but, you know, we're all guilty of that kind of thing. But at least it's, it, it behooves us to be aware of what our limitations are and what our prejudices are and the theory of maybe. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it is and it isn't in certain ways, and maybe it's inexpressible. Uh, that's thumbnail sketch of Syadvad. Um, that tool can allow you to understand at least points of view that you radically disagree with. But again, that requires courage. Do you really want to understand the mind of Adolf Hitler and sympathize with him? Do you really want to um, say that Jeffrey Dahmer had reasons for doing what he did? That, that what he did in his own universe made sense to him? 
that does require courage. Uh, it's the old um, thing from the Lord of the Rings. It, it does you no good to study the black arts too much, even as uh, someone who's trying to debunk them. Um, people are afraid of that kind of thing, and I don't blame them. Because um, <clears throat> you end up making huge mistakes when you wade into that kind of territory. But an interesting thing that, uh, that I raised um, with Mystic of the Sands was um, my fascination with these tools, with the, the tools that have been um, sort of, I won't say worked out, but sort of um, espoused maybe, or used by the Jains and Buddhists and various other Indian or Eastern philosophies. Um, make me fascinated by things like depressive realism and antinatalism and things like that. People wonder why the heck I waste so much of my time and energy on this kind of thing, because in a way it is related. Um, <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that the, the Jains, if anything, have a point of view which is, if anything, even more negative than the most negative of them all. Um, compared to Jain cosmology or philosophy or whatever, um, I don't know, David Benatar or Thomas Ligotti is, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I said he was a giddy optimist, either of these people. Because the assumption is that death will take you out of there, although I think um, Ligotti also sort of hinted that maybe death will just send us to a worse place in some of his novels. I don't know. I haven't read all of his stuff. Um, but the Jains say even death is useless. Okay, so because the, de the Jains actually have this ritual suicide where they fast themselves to death. And it still takes place to this day. Um, Self-mortification, fasting, and all this kind of thing is highly regarded by the Jains. Um, and they do advocate controlled and um, conscientious, I guess, suicide, but um, only for people who have really thought it through and understand what they're getting into. And I, I certainly I heartily agree for some people suicide is the best option I mean, or, or I can see how it might be seen that way and I you know I, I think it, there's a certain degree of inhumanity in in having a completely dismissive attitude towards suicide um, but the Jains also insist that suicide is kind of a cop-out um, it might help you a little bit but the fundamental nature of reality is just going to keep going on. Um, their, I guess, objection to antinatalism, I suppose, would be, okay, so the human race isn't extinct anymore. <laughs> There's the universe. It's still there. Um, you haven't really done anything. Nothing. Zero. Um, so it's not really being against antinatalism, because there's a powerful streak of antinatalism in the, uh, in the Jain tradition, but in most religiously uncompromising traditions or philosophically uncompromising positions, there is a streak of that. The world isn't worth having children in. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, but advocating um, a child-free life as a means of um, concentrating on your own self-improvement isn't the same thing as saying that it's unethical to breed. Um, I think that the Jains would simply say that it's unethical to do anything. Um, they walk around with masks on their face so that they don't, or some of them do, so that they don't inhale insects. They're forbidden to eat anything that might have resulted in any death at all. The more extreme Jains uh, refuse to eat anything. I guess you'd call them fractarians. They'll, they'll eat nothing that even results in the death of a plant. You can only eat something that you can pick off the plant without harming it. And you're not allowed to eat root vegetables because you, you dig up the earth and you might harm something in there. So they have this extreme aversion to harm just the way, the same way that, uh, that you know, a Benatarian, I guess, might have. Um, but again, it's, it's a question of emphasis. Why do they have this extreme aversion to that thing? Uh, because that, the harm is just one more manifestation of the brutishness of the universe that we're in. And there's no way out of the universe, except for completely refusing to accept its reality. You sit down and you stop. You don't espouse anything. You don't think anything. 
you don't do anything. You stop eating, you stop drinking. If at all possible, I suppose a Jane would say you should stop breathing or you should stop your heart. <laughs> you, know, you should stop. Um, that's the only way out. And antinatalism to them, I think, would be at the most optimistic, a half measure. Um, because they would say, okay, very well, but look at the universe around you. You think you're going to stop all that from happening? <laughs> that's the wheel of existence, and that's the, the Jain cosmology, the wheel of existence, the samsara, I guess you'd call it, and the Hindus call it, Buddhists call it that, uh, is a wheel that's never started turning and will never stop. It's the phenomenal universe. It just is. End of story. You have to get off that wheel. Now, once you start getting into the cosmological, I get lost. Um, it's not that I that I'm not interested in that kind of thing, but I, you know, again, I have a human mind, and and it's it's hard to wrap your mind around things like like the Eastern uh, cosmologies, the Buddhist or Hindu cosmologies, the Jain cosmologies. Um, they're they tend to blow the mind, and I think that they're meant to blow the mind, like. In the, the, the Zen tradition, blowing the mind is what it's all about. Um, but I do think that they have a lot of very useful tools, and I can see why someone who is of the Pyronic tradition might uh, be interested in, in Jainism, because there are great similarities there. Skepticism, um, it often gets called a solipsistic faith, or I, if you could call it a faith. But as I say, um, uh, India is famous for producing um, life-denying philosophies, and I think in the Indian tradition, um, Jainism is probably the most negative of them all. I'd like to see somebody come up with something as negative or more negative than Jainism when you get right down to brass tacks. Uh, you'll meet Jains in India, or I think there's a few in the West Indies, uh, communities of them, and there's Jains that have migrated all over the world, and you probably notice they're just like other people in many ways. But there are those among them who take it all seriously and who do fast themselves to death and wear the masks and walk around naked and, and you know, whisk the insects out of their path with brooms. I've actually seen such people in my life. Um, and they even have a negative view of their own philosophy. They paint the picture of a universe in which their message really doesn't make much difference anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's probably why it doesn't really have an ultimate appeal to me. But it, can, it, it could simply be that I, I lack the necessary understanding of what they're, what they're positing. Um, but they do, um, at the end of the day, say that no matter what happens, we will all achieve liberation from this mess called phenomenality, causality and everything. Eventually. That's there's no other way for you there's no way for you not to. Because we're only bound to it by our own desires. And once we understand the universe for what it is, we will stop and we will get off this wheel of existence. The only way I could think things might be more extreme than Jainism at heart would be, as I mentioned again, the mystic of the sands. Um, if you believe that you could somehow destroy the wheel of existence or stop it from moving, um, that's the red button, but writ large, you're going to destroy the universe, <laughs> now, or the multiverse, or the cosmos, or whatever. Uh, okay, fill your boots on that one, have fun, <laughs> if that's what somebody wants to do. Um, <clears throat> so, no, I'm not a Jane. Um, in my time, I boozed it up, chased women, and did all the other stuff that younger people do. And now I'm married. I'm certainly not celibate. I'm not a vegetarian, and uh, I swat flies and all that kind of thing. Um, but the Jains and people of their ilk have come up with very useful tools. Um, one thing that I that I, that I sort of like to sort of use as a caveat to all of this, however, is I rather suspect that. A lot more people believe that the universe is that way uh, than we realize. They may not put it in the same terms as the Jains do, 
But this idea of life denial or reality denial is a very old one. And the Jains themselves say that uh, even though their, their sect or their um, school of thought emerged, I think, around the 6th century BCE, they claim to represent a tradition that goes right back to the beginning of time. Um, and I would say that there's elements of that in every philosophy. There's elements of life or reality denial in all of them. Um, you know, that this world or this universe is a profane place. Um, now, again, if you inject guilt into Jainism, you get something completely different than I think that I see in it. Because some people say that the universe is not just, well, as I just said, that, that the universe is not just some place that we don't want to be in. It's actually evil. And you get this, there's a very fine line between believing that the universe is um, not desirable and the universe is evil. That life is not a nice condition to be in to believing that life is horrible. Uh, not just horrible and unendurable, but horrible in a positive sense. Uh, active evil that must be stopped. And then, you know, the kind of Manichaean attitude. Um, the, uh, the cathartic or cathar attitude that the physical universe is profane, uh, is infected with Satan or something like this. Uh, there's a lot of that, the idea that the world or the universe is split into two things. Now that that is, I, if you ask me, that's one of the sort of pratfalls of the idea of seeing reality in an extremely negative light, and the only rational thing to do is to escape from it. It can lead to witch hunting if you if you bring guilt into it. If you do, and that, and again, that's why Anakantavada is so important, or you know, Syadvad is so important. Because it helps, I think, deal with the haram sort of attitude. The, word, the universe is halal and haram. This is an Islamic term saying that the universe is made up of good and bad. The bad must be fought, the good must be promoted. Um, because what happens in that case is, of course, you get ideas like infidel, um, you know, I guess in this context of this discussion, natalist, um, this kind of thing. People who are defective, stupid, or evil. Um, that's why it's so important to understand that other people have reasons for feeling the way they feel about things. It's like Nietzschean philosophy, which is ironic. I came to Nietzsche through the back door, through Anakantavada, because he has something very similar, perspectivism. Like Nietzsche, you have to come at these things all at once, because if you sort of cherry-pick or sort of treat it as a buffet well, you'll, where you'll take a little bit of this and leave that, you get a distorted view of things. It's like being a Jain without subscribing, I guess, to Anikantavada. You can sort of think that there are evil people out there. It's like the the um, objection that people have towards the more militant um, animal rights types, like PETA. They say, well, you end up going the other way. You, you end up so obsessed with fighting evil that you become evil yourself. You reach for these hellish tools like guilt which are ultimately just as bad as slitting an animal's throat. Um, you've got, you know, again, that's that's one of the dangers of of seeing the universe in a certain light. And that's why I think Anakantavada is very, very, very important um, uh, in terms of working out uh, a philosophy of ethics or of morals. Um, but again, it takes courage. Hitler had reasons for thinking the way he did. and. It's not fun, and it's not nice to imagine that, you know, I would have done the same thing had I been in his position, but it's entirely possible, maybe.